remember, not only are they superb solidarity after activists, but they've been working in solidarity for over 30 years. So I wanted to talk more to you tonight about what makes a great solidarity activist. They are great solidarity activists. And they fit these things I'm going to say. The first thing is now to do passion. Because we, we all care about our close friends and our families and people in our circle, but if you're going to be a solidarity activist, you have to care about people that you barely know or people that you don't know. Take their burdens on as your burden. They have to be confident. They have to know what they're doing. It's great to be well-meaning, but the well-meaning and confident to do more harm than good. And, and they are very, very cultural sensitivity. You have to realize that, forgetting the bad guys, good people, people you care for and respect, don't always think the way you think, and don't always act the way you act. And you have to be exquisitely sensitive when you're in their land and, and you are trying to help them, to help them, give them the help they want, not the help you think they need. And, and they're very much like that. But what I wanted to concentrate on today is the last thing, and that's courage. Now, there's lots of ways to show courage, and a lot of the people in this room are prepared to work courageously for the people of Latin America or the people here of the Latin America, the diaspora. But they have physical, true courage. They live in the war zone, in the Contra War in the 80s. Jenny wrote a book about it called The Red Thread, and uh, she will be at the, the table uh, back there being happy to autograph copies if you want that book. It is a superb book. Of the two books that I tell people who will go into Nicaragua, one is Nicaragua for Beginners and the other is The Red Thread. That's the book you read if you want to know about Nicaragua today it, by reading about Nicaragua in the 1980s. And now they're doing this company work, company men work in Honduras. Do you realize that Honduras, other than places where there's an active war going on, literal war, warfare, Honduras is the most dangerous place in the world. They work in Honduras. Every time they cross from Nicaragua over the border into Honduras, they're putting their lives at risk, literally. They, they could be in prison, they could be tortured, they could be killed, they could be disappeared. And a, a, a woman named Sally Jones of Peace Action New York was with us, with me in, in November in Nicaragua. We had dinner with Jenny, but, this, but she wrote this poem for both Jenny and Tom. And she said, To go where fear is pervasive, to witness the brunt of brutality, to hold out the hand of friendship, saves life, lives and changes the world. So you're looking at two truly great solidarity activists. It's my privilege to present them with the International White Dove Award on behalf of the Rochester Committee on Latin America. special thank yous to Arnie and Margaret Ann, who have been just dear friends and compañeros for many, many decades. Um, also, thank you to Rakla for your steadfast work, many years of work. Uh, in 1989, we spent a year at Colgate Rochester Divinity School, and Rakla was a lifeline at that time. 
Also just want to acknowledge, because we're in this region of the country, in this land, um, two um, elders who provided key guidance at crucial times, Chief Jake Swamp and Grandmother Twyla Nitch. Also want to thank and acknowledge um, the work for many, many decades as we worked in Central America on the ground. <coughs> we were very aware of the constant work of Peter Mott here in the north, organizing, networking, connecting, tying people together. And it made all the difference to be in the ground in, when your life is at risk and to be afraid and to know that people here were holding and watching and making sure that people knew we were there meant the world. So many of you, Peter, Gail, Arnie, Margaret Ann, you know the Levines who can't be here. Your steadfast commitment has meant everything and enables many of us to do the work we do. 31 years ago, almost this time of year, Tom and I both arrived in Nicaragua. Um, I'm going to talk tonight because we didn't have a lot of time, so we decided that I would share our reflection. This is for both of us. <coughs> we arrived in Nicaragua with Witness for Peace. We were witnessing the historic transformation of Nicaraguan society that had drawn international attention. We were also witnessing a U.S. war, which was aimed at destroying it. We made a commitment for six months to stand with the people of Nicaragua. We never imagined that 31 years later we would be standing here tonight after three decades of work in Central America. In the 1980s, we were witnesses, along with many, many others, to the impact of US-sponsored counterinsurgency wars in Central America. At that time, as many of you know, U.S. policy was informed by U.S. experience in Vietnam, where the U.S. military suffered a humiliating defeat because of the will of a poor and determined people who withstood a vastly superior military power. And that experience in Vietnam gave rise to a new military doctrine called low-intensity warfare. The low intensity refers to low U.S. exposure. U.S., rather than putting combat troops on the ground that could be harmed, learned to use proxy forces and other militaries. And the U.S. role was now to advise, train, equip, provide intelligence and funding for these wars. However, the impact on the ground was very high. This marked a shift in military doctrine where the target was no longer another military, but the civilian population. It was the people themselves that became the enemy and the target. The implications for human rights work were huge. Also, the a hallmark of this low intensity warfare was the deliberate use of terror to shock people into compliance with U.S. political will in the region. I'm just going to read briefly a little passage from the book Red Thread that describes what this policy was about. <coughs> this is from Dr. Derek Summerfield from the um, me, Medical Foundation for the Care of Torture Victims. He describes low-intensity warfare in this way. Population is the target. Through systemic violence and terror, the aim is to penetrate into homes, families, the entire social fabric of gross, grassroots social relations. It is a science of warfare whose goal is to control the qualitative aspects of human life, to produce demoralization and paralysis. Terror is sown, not randomly, but also through targeted assaults on health workers, teachers, cooperative leaders, anyone whose work symbolizes shared values and aspirations. Torture, mutilation, and execution in front of family members are routine. Many of you accompanied the people of Central America as they suffered the results of those policies for many decades. 
Another hallmark of this policy was the training of special forces who specialized in psychological operations and the use of terror. They began to have names, the Contra in Nicaragua, the Mano Blanco in El Salvador, the Battalion 316 in Honduras, the Ebi in Guatemala. Much of their training was done at the School of the Americas here in Fort Benning, Georgia. In Guatemala, the most egregious expression of this type of warfare was carried out and resulted in acts of genocide. By 1990, U.S. policy had resulted in hundreds of thousands of dead, tortured, forcibly disappeared throughout Central America. It resulted in, in widespread populations that had been terrorized deliberately and that carried trauma, individual, collective, historic, and intergenerational. And despite the imposition of this war of terror, there came a military impasse. No one could win. And so that led to negotiated peace settlements. So in the 1990s, the peace processes began. In Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala, there were processes of disarmament, reinsertion of combatants, and truth commissions. Because the people said that in order for this not to happen again, impunity needed to be addressed. People needed to know who did what to whom. And this was not for revenge or retribution, but so that nunca jamás, never again. And that that was essential for healing. In this context, Honduras was in a very different position than the other three countries where there had been active wars. Honduras, during the 1970s and 80s, was the U.S. staging ground for these counterinsurgency wars in the rest of the region. It was where a large military base was. It was the U.S. intelligence hub. It was where the bases for all the Contra were based on the southern border. It was where the refugees from El Salvador fled and were held in camps. In Honduras, unlike the other countries, there was no process of disarmament. On the contrary, many of the arms that were being taken away from ex-combatants in the other countries were flowing into Honduras. There was no truth, no accountability, no record of what had happened. And social pressure was building because of the conditions of extreme poverty and inequality. In this context, in 2005, Manuel Zelaya was elected president, became president. He came from the elite. Not much was expected new. However, in his cabinet, there were people from the center left. And they began to say, instead of repressing the social movement, we need to dialogue with them. And Zelaya listened and began to make small reforms, increasing minimum wage, extending agricultural credit to small farmers, began to let some of the human rights cases from the 1980s, forced disappearance cases that were in impunity, move forward and go to the international court, and began to associate more with the emerging economic blocks in Central America, of which the U.S. was not, didn't have the power to control, such as Alba. Most importantly, what the social movements were saying at that time was that in Honduras, what was needed was structural change, and that in order to do that, there needed to be a constituent assembly. The constitution needed to be opened up, and change needed to be made in the constitution that would help to create structural equality. And this created a major conflict in Honduras, where the wealthy elite said, absolutely not, cannot be touched and the social movements were pushing for the constituent assembly. So Zelaya made a compromise and agreed to a non-binding opinion poll to poll the population on the extent of, of the will of the population to have a constituent assembly. And this would happen leading up to elections that were going to happen later that year in which the social movements were running candidates for president and vice president. So on June 28th, on the eve of this 
non-binding opinion poll. There was a military coup d'etat in Honduras. That evening, as the trucks were loading up the ballots to deliver to the polling stations where people could vote, non-binding opinion poll, but could vote and express their opinion that whether structural change through constituent assembly was needed in Honduras, the military burst into the president's home, broke down the doors, took him in his pajamas to Pamarola Air Force Base, where he was then flown to San Jose, Costa Rica and deposited in the middle of the night. Honduras entered into a state of siege, total blackout. Honduras was immediately expelled from the Organization of American States. And the coup sent shockwaves throughout all of Central America because Latin America was looking at what could be the first successful military coup of the 21st century, a return to the past, a return to military dictatorships after all that had been done and all the suffering to emerge from that type of power system. And so Latin America resolved that that coup in Honduras must be reversed, that Zelaya needed to return and democratic order needed to be restored. At this time, Tom and I were in Nicaragua, in Managua. Uh, I, with several other women, had been organizing for several years a regional conference on trauma and social change. We had social movement leaders th throughout the region talking about the impact of low-intensity warfare, a policy that deliberately terrorizes people who are working for social justice, and how to heal from that so that social work, change work can continue. In the middle of that conference, I got a call from Tom, who said, I need 10 minutes outside. So I went outside, and he told us the coup had happened in Honduras, and the social movement leaders were calling him, saying, we need you all to come. We need international presence. We don't know what's going to happen here. We're going into hiding. We're not safe. We need international presence on the ground. What do we do? We took this request to the conference, and the decision was made, we go. So Tom and Father Joe Mulligan, a Jesuit, Father Roy Bourgeois, many of you know from the SOA Watch, were some of the first to arrive in Honduras days after the coup. What they and many others afterwards witnessed was in response to the coup in Honduras, a massive, spontaneous, peaceful protest Every day, tens of thousands of people in the street asking for a return of their elected president and a restoration of democratic order. This was historic for a country which was heavily armed and for a region emerging from armed conflict. These were massive, peaceful, unarmed protests. It should have been headlines around the world. Latin America was working at every level to get Zelaya back into the country. They tried to fly him in through the airport. The military took the tarmac and didn't allow the plane to fly, to land. They took him to Nicaragua and he tried for weeks to cross by land across the, the Nicaraguan border into Honduras. The military blocked it. Finally, he was smuggled into Honduras. We don't know how exactly an emerge surfaced in the Brazilian embassy in the middle of Tegucigalpa, thinking that once he was in the country, a, a negotiation could happen for him to resume the presidency, finish out his term, restore democratic order. He spent four months under siege in the Brazilian embassy until finally he had to leave. All of this time, the people of Honduras sustained peaceful resistance to the coup. Throughout the country, on the walls, on t-shirts, on hats, in songs, on posters, on anything that could carry this message, was the message, Nos tienen miedo porque no les tenemos miedo. They are afraid of us because we are no longer afraid of them. That was the message of the Honduran people. They knew that fear and terror had been used to control, repress, and subjugate, and that in order to be free, they needed to drop their fear. And they had dropped their fear. 
The response, however, was to increase the repression. And we began to see a return of the same type of counterinsurgency wars and policies and dirty war of the 80s at a whole new level and a whole new level of intensity. And we began to see that the lessons from Vietnam that then were perfected and worked out during the 1980s in Central America and then informed by the U.S. war in Colombia, Plan Colombia, and also in Iraq, were all being come to brought to bear in Honduras, and we were seeing a very new type of war. Since the coup in 2009, Honduras has experienced a permanent and escalating human rights crisis. It is a country that is hyper-militarized. Police, military, special forces called Tigres Cobras, and a new conflation of the military and the police called military police are all over. The current president campaigned on a promise to put a soldier on every corner. In this context, there's this high level of targeted political violence. Human rights defenders, journalists, lawyers, peasants, indigenous, Afro-descendants, political opposition, social movements, and anyone trying to protect natural resources from extraction are targeted, deliberately targeted. By 2012, San Pedro Sula in northern Honduras had become the most deadly city in the world. And as Arnie said, Honduras is the most deadly country in the world outside of an active war zone. The World Health Organization has declared that Honduras has a homicide epidemic. Just to give you an idea of the numbers, Honduras has about, um, in this, according to this homicide statistics, 90 homicides per 100,000 population. That's about one per hour. In comparison, in El Salvador, which has the next highest um, violence rates in the region, the number is 60. In Nicaragua, it's 12. The US, 4.7. And Canada, 1.6. So if you can imagine Honduras, a very small country, 90 per 100,000. And this is all described by U.S. State Department and the post-coup presidents in Honduras as common crime and the result of weak institutions that need huge amounts of U.S. backing to strengthen them. This despite the findings of two truth commissions that stated that there had been an illegal military coup, that both the police and the military have extensive links to organized crime, drug trafficking, and are rampantly corrupt. That they are responsible for the majority of reported human rights abuses. That there is a pattern of targeted political violence, excessive use of force, forced disappearance, torture, and summary executions. In 2014, Casa Alianza, which is a child advocate center that works with abandoned children, was documenting an average of 90 children who were being murdered per month in extrajudicial killings as part of a social cleansing program. Last summer, in 2014, the region saw a mass exodus of children fleeing the violence in the region, an almost 80% increase in the number of children left the region, many of them alone, making a very treacherous journey all the way north across borders some 60 to 100,000 of them came to the United States trying to get safe. U.S. policy from the very day of the coup has been to lend full support. Funding has escalated. Military budgets have gone way up. There are new bases being put in. This year, there's apparently 21 new airstrips that will be put in, and the State Department refers to Honduras as our strongest partner in the region. They justify this huge boost in militarization as needing to fight drug war and common crime. However, in reality, there is no impact on drug flows. 
the violence levels continue to climb, human rights abuses continue to climb, to climb, and the U.S. is effectively partnering with state security forces which are known to have a high level of criminality and corruption. In 2015, the White House announced a new plan called Plan Prosperidad, Plan Prosperity. Um, and they say that now new money is needed in order to make the region prosperous so that the children won't leave anymore because the children represent a threat to U.S. national security. So they are asking Congress for $1 million. This will be the first of a five-year program. The, one, the, the budget information that exists for the $1 billion request doubles the military funding that is already way accelerated. And this plan is modeled after Plan Colombia. What we see in the region after 30 years is rather than learning from the lessons of the past and the tragic impact that those policies have had, we see a new war, a new cycle of violence, terror, and trauma. And in this context, it's very important to bear witness, to accompany, to advocate for policies that address the real root causes of the violence, and to call on our country to stop waging war, and to insist on truth and accountability. Many of you here in Rakhla also have 30 years of experience working for justice in Central America. And you carry historic memory. You know the past. And you can talk about the repetition of cycles of violence. And your voices are very needed because the U.S. has not learned the lessons from the past. And we are repeating them. And so you all are witnesses and your voices are needed, and you can speak from the truth that you know, so that one day in Central America we can say, nunca jamás, this will never happen again. And I want to end with the words of a Nicaraguan writer who won a human rights prize for his writing. And he says, it is much easier to begin a war than to end it, and even more difficult to repair the invisible consequences those stains on the soul that can never be erased. So I want to end there, just ask all of you to, to sign the letters that, that Grania had in the back, call on your senators and your members of Congress to, to stop, that you know the past and that it can't happen again, and to use your voice and use your witness. And if anybody has questions, we're, we can answer questions later, or what the time frame is now, but I'd like to leave it there. And thank you very much for, for honoring us with this, this recognition. <laughs> Tom was invited and served um, on the Commission of Truth in Honduras. There were two truth, truth commissions, an official one and a, a People's Truth Commission. And he was the Executive Secretary for the People's Truth Commission. And so this is their report. Do you want to give it to Rob? Wonderful. Thank you so much. I just want you to know that in 2012, Granny and Marcus descended on us like Mary Poppins. <laughs> <laughs> and Rockwell will never be the same. <laughs> you'll get, you'll get a, to a sense of Granny's impressive credentials. She is Dr. Granny and Marcus by reading her bio. And in fact, in that bio, you can, you can almost feel her passion. But you really have to experience her in action to, to appreciate the full extent of her commitment. And ever since she joined Rockwood, Granny has given so much of herself to every single thing she undertakes that it's hard to believe she has time for anything else. She's a brilliant editor of the brilliant editor of Rockland newsletter and our public relations point person. She's a born researcher and teacher, and she shares information such as this is a very enlightening article on how neoliberalism works in Latin America, and particularly in El Salvador. It details how the United States is subverting the efforts of the leftist El Salvadoran government to reduce inequality. 
She produces the Rice and Beans program booklets, and this is a marvelous booklet tonight. It's just full of all kinds of information. She writes position papers. She alerts us about actions almost daily, <laughs> such as, she says, regarding Rockless sign-on letter to the president, as you know, the Obama administration has opened a huge new family detention center in Dilly, Texas, where mostly mothers and children are housed. And DHS has another operation in Carnes, Texas. Many studies have concluded that these centers lead to much suffering for mothers and children, that abuses take place in these so-called family detention centers, and that they should be closed. So she's very clear on what we need to do. And as you know, tonight she was up with the letters I hope all of you had a chance to sign them. Her energy and her generosity really know no bounds. She even baked cookies for our dessert tonight. But Rockla isn't Granny's only commitment. Immigration justice is her passion, and she's Rockla's link with the Greater Rochester Coalition for Immigration Justice. She's also secretary for the Downtown Presbyterian Church Justice Team, and she's active for the Band of Rebels. And she makes time to provide daycare for her three grandchildren who love being with her during the week. So it's an honor and a delight to present Brownie and Marcus with the 2015 White Dove Award. Um, I'm honored to receive this honor from Rockla. And, and I just want you to know that you all have been my inspirations and my guides and um, picking up the pieces when I was tired um, since I've been here and so I just want to thank you all for this award. Uh, I have to say I was very surprised that I was going to receive it. Um, I also want to thank Jenny for her, oh, I don't know what to say, her um, Her description, I guess, but that's an inadequate word. Um, and for the passion and feeling behind her words, talking about the U.S. history in Latin America. And, and what I'm going to talk about tonight is actually the, the other side of the coin, in, in a way. Um, I have, since approximately the same time for the same more or less three decades, um, or more actually, I've been involved with immigrants in the United States, um, both in Florida and in New York and on the border of Mexico. So um, I, I just, uh, I think I've become, I'm going to talk about immorality. Not that kind of immorality, our immorality as a country and our complicity in the human rights violations and the deaths and all the things that have gone along with both our policy in Latin America but also our policy toward the people that have been driven to our country because of our policies. So there is an intimate connection between them. They're not separate things. And that, that's really what I've, I've learned over the years. It's not good enough to just say, well, I mean, it's wonderful to write a letter to support the DREAM Act or to try to improve the conditions of farm workers um, or to give water and food to people dying in the desert, but they're really a piece. They're all of a piece, and they're all part of the U.S.'s monumentally immoral acts. And I was trying to write this today, and I was thinking, boy, you sound like an angry old lady. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is not inspiring. But I, um, I, the more I wrote and the more I thought about it, the more I really was angry. And I am. I, I think we're all sick and tired and angry and discouraged sometimes about our 
our work and the fact that we work and we work and we work and things just seem to get worse. Um, so I, I, you know, with that, I will, I also want to uh, welcome Senor Larios, who's come here from Mexico a long way to find out about what happened to his son and to learn more about the work that his son was doing. And I, I really want to thank him for his courage in, 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 a, in talking to OSHA and talking to these um, you know, agents in the United States, which has to be a really, really difficult thing to do and a heartbreaking thing to do. I um, also want to welcome Bienvenidos a, a los trabajadores agricolas. Um, I'm glad you could come. Um, I hope you all have had a chance to come, talk with them. A documentary I saw last year called, um, which talked about forced migration from Latin America, was called Harvest of Empire. A bunch of you have probably seen it. Um, and it really taught, and it showed the numbers of people that, because of our low intensity warfare and our not so low intensity warfare, and our economic, neoliberal economic policies and our trade agreements, and, and this whole package of things has driven hundreds of millions, actually, millions of people to the United States, not because they wanted to leave their homes. They love their homes. They would much rather stay there if they could. They're not coming here so they can have a swimming pool or a lifestyle upgrade. So, you know, we need to know that. Um, and, and as Jenny said, Rockle members have, we all know the history, you all know the history, you've lived the history, and so you know what, what has happened to people and why they are here in the U.S. Um, I don't need to go over some of the things that Jenny's already talked about. But I say when the incredibly courageous and resilient people suffering from our policies arrive here in desperation, we often shut the door in their faces. Um, some of you that were involved in sanctuary stood with, <clears throat> stood with people who needed to be able to stay here because they could not return. The politicians who enact our immigration laws and, the, and these poli implementation of policies cruelly choose to ignore the connection between U.S. injustices in Latin America and the real human beings who suffer the direct consequences of destitution, the loss of home and family, violence, torture, and repression. Here we are in 2015, approaching the anniversary of the assassination of Archbishop of the Archbishop of El Salvador, Oscar Romero, who has actually just been named blessed by the Catholic Church, um, who was assassinated in 1980 as he stood in the way of those who were repressing the Salvadoran people. We too must stand in the way, as Jenny and Tom have done their whole lives. The U.S. is still supporting the perpetrators of re repression in Honduras and elsewhere, and sowing violence and death through security and anti-drug agreements like the Merida Initiative in Mexico, Plan Colombia, and the Alliance for Prosperity Plan with the Northern Triangle countries in Central America. The U.S. continues to devise economic agreements like the Partnership for Growth and the proposed Trans-Pacific Partnership that benefit the U.S. and Latin American elites 
but not the majority of their people. These policies won't stop, so neither must we. We must not be quiet. Our so-called immigration crises are of our own making, and we are responsible. Remember the 62,000 plus children, often with their mothers who fled violence in Central America and were detained last year in freezing detention cells in Artesia, New Mexico. They came because of the increasing murders in the Northern Triangle countries, fallout from the wars there and the Honduran coup in 2009. Did we greet them with compassion? Hardly. The vast majority of those vulnerable women and children have been deported back to their countries by means of rocket docket video appearances without representation or due process. Back to the violence and privation they fled despite valiant attempts by volunteer immigration lawyers working in adverse conditions to defend them. It has been already documented that a number of these children have been killed when they return to Honduras. Many of those that remain are consigned to the huge new family detention centers in Dilly, Texas and Carnes, Texas, where their education is inadequate, their living quarters restricted, and their diets limited. This is immoral and we must express our outrage. Meanwhile, nearly 7,000 migrants have died in our deserts on the southern border since 1994, and they continue to die despite ministries of water and food in the desert and reduced numbers of immigrants trying to cross the border. This is because our government throws billions and billions of our taxpayer dollars at increasing militarization of the southern and now the northern borders. This is immoral, too, and we must express our outrage. Hundreds of thousands of these families leaving these children, some of them, to the mercies of uh, what do you call child protective services. ISIS re just recently, two weeks ago, conducted nationwide raids as mostly against mostly those with only immigration offenses who have worked here for years, leaving more children without a parent. This despite the fact that they have put out press releases since 2012 saying that they are not targeting families. They're not targeting the parents of children. This is propaganda. It is a lie. It, and they claim they're targeting serious uh, violent felons, but that is simply not the case. Yes, they do pick up serious violent felons, but they also pick up a number of just hard-working people with families. How do we stop the forced migrations, the families destroyed by deportation, the crushed dreams, the immigrants continuing to be criminalized, and the suffering of children both here and in Latin America? The answer is together and loudly. We keep fighting wherever, whenever, and however we can. Here are a few suggestions. Okay, support the work of people like Mr. Larios and the May 1st Farm Workers Committee and stand with them and other impacted people. This is where the energy is. It is the young dreamers who have actually pushed push the changes that have resulted in the DACA program. They were willing to risk their, their risk deportation, risk detention, stand with them. They are 
the people of the future. Stand in the way. Some of my colleagues at No More Deaths in, in Tucson, Arizona, and on the border, blocked buses leaving detention centers. They, they attach themselves to each other with pipes. And 19 of them are now on, um, in trial for doing this, for various um, uh, charges, including a felony. Uh, it's not easy to do. And yes, there's the uncertainty of what happens when I go to jail. It's, it's, it's difficult and it's painful. And as somebody who's done it, I can tell you, not an experience I wanted to have to do for very long. But if more people did that, it would change because it flies in the face of who Americans think they are. 24 churches throughout the U.S. have started a sanctuary program again. There are models all over the country, but most notably at Southside Presbyterian Church in Tucson, which Gail and Peter are graduates of. And um, John Fife, was, the pastor there, was one of the original founders of Sanctuary. Well, that's starting to happen. Different denominations, not all Presbyterians, all over the country, because people realize what an immoral situation we have when contributing family members are being shipped in the middle of the night with no money and no nothing and, and, and just allowed and put in by very violent and untenable situations. We can join them in doing sanctuary here in the U.S when it's the last resort to keep someone from being deported. You can stand in the way closer to home. Join the Greater Rochester Coalition Deportation Defense Task Force. We are spe 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 specifically working on ways to mitigate the harms of those facing detention and deportation here in Rochester. We're just getting started as a, um, a task force of the Greater Rochester Coalition, but I have a sign-up sheet in the back on the table where the letters are. So if that's something that might interest you, then go ahead and do it. Or you can go to Dilly, Texas on May 2nd. There is going to be a series of actions at that family detention center, which is being touted as this wonderful thing by the Department of Homeland Security. But it's 2,500 mothers and children who are living in really inhumane conditions. So I, you know, I'm hoping to go there first myself, go there also. So if you might be interested in doing that, I have flyers not here, but I can send them to you, and um, we'll see. And then, of course, I hope you signed our letters tonight. Um, I think we got so far about 60, so I'm, uh, I'm really pleased. Thank you so much. And thank you for um, giving me this wonderful award. I really appreciate it. I think that Senor Jose and uh, Senor Tenia Wanted to just say a few words to everyone. Tengan todos muy buenas noches. Hope everybody is having a wonderful night. Uh, mi nombre es Jose Cañas, eh, originario de El Salvador. I'm Jose Cañas. I'm from El Salvador. Es para mí un gran honor estar ante ustedes. Uh, it's a great honor to me to be here before you tonight. Y quiero darles un fuerte saludo y muchos agradecimientos de parte de mis compañeros trabajadores y miembros del Comité de Trabajadores Agrícolas Primero de Mayo del Estado de Nueva York. And I want to thank everybody for this opportunity on behalf of um, all of my work companions in the 1st of May Workers Committee here in New York. Es para mí este momento muy emotivo. Eh, quiero pedirles disculpas por mi voz cortante. 
Uh, and it's a very emotional moment, and I hope that you can forgive my um, emotions. Ya que para mí es uno de los eventos mucho más importantes a los que yo he asistido en mi vida. Because to me, this event is one of the most important um, gatherings that I've participated in in my life. Como el estar presente en uno de los reconocimientos a dos mujeres y a su esposo. To be here at the um, recognition of these three wonderful people and their work. Muy valientes y muy importantes en mi vida. That are so brave and have been so important to my life. Quiero traer a cuenta un poco de las palabras de Jennifer. And I want to repeat some of the words of Jennifer. Hablaba un poco de El Salvador. She spoke a little bit of my country, El Salvador. Las palabras de ella me generaron confianza. Um, her words gave me confidence. Para poder decir algo ante ustedes en este momento. To say something before all of you tonight. Cuando yo tenía 13 años de edad. When I was 13. Yo fui golpeado por los cuerpos de seguridad en El Salvador. Um, I was brutally assaulted by the security forces in El Salvador. Por la Guardia Nacional en El Salvador. The National Guard of El Salvador. Quiero decirles también que para nosotros existió un hombre muy importante en El Salvador. And I want everybody to know here that for us from El Salvador there was a man who was singularly important to us. Monseñor Romero. Uh, el Señor Romero. Quien fue uno de los defensores de los campesinos en El Salvador. Who was a great defender of the um, farm workers in El Salvador. Y murió a manos de grupos criminales como mencionaba Jennifer. And he died at the hands of many criminals. La mano blanca, el escuadrón de la muerte y los grupos de orden. Of the white hand, the death squads, and the um, security forces of El Salvador. Fueron momentos difíciles para la juventud en aquel entonces. And it created a lot of difficult moments for the young people in my country. Donde solo teníamos dos opciones, los hijos de los campesinos, porque yo soy hijo de campesinos y soy campesino. And it really created a world where we only had two options for all of the sons of farm workers, for which I, I am a son of a farm worker. Al ejército, por una opresión, por el, recluta, el reclutamiento forzoso. The first option was to join the army through almost a forced recruitment. O a la guerrilla por defender nuestros derechos. Or to join the rebel forces to defend our rights. No teníamos opciones los jóvenes en ese entonces. We had no other options as young people in, in those moments. Si bien es cierto, fueron las políticas de este país que financiaron la guerra en El Salvador. And it is true that it was the politics of this country, the United States, that financed the wars in my country. Pero también, también hubieron personas de este país como voluntarios que llegaron a ayudarnos y apoyarnos en El Salvador. But there were also many individuals from this country who came and supported us as a, as a nation. Como Jennifer, su esposo y otros grupos que llegaron a El Salvador y nosotros les llamábamos Los Ángeles de la Tierra. Just as Jennifer and, and her husband did and we in El Salvador called them um, Angels on Earth. Porque fueron personas que comenzaron sobre el diálogo de la paz en El Salvador. Because they were the ones who started it, a dialogue of peace in El Salvador. Nosotros como campesinos, hijos de campesinos y nuestros padres, lo vivimos y lo sufrimos en carne propia. Um, we who were farm workers and the sons and daughters of farm workers, we really suffered um, these attacks. You know. Pero también es bien difícil pensar que en estos momentos nosotros los campesinos en un país como este sigamos sufriendo lo mismo and it's very difficult to think that as farm workers now in this country we still are suffering aprovecho la oportunidad para dar las gracias a Crania Marcos and I want to take the opportunity to thank Crania Marcos sí. Una mujer muy valiente que se ha puesto al frente de nosotros como trabajadores agrícolas en este país. Somebody who took 
the courage to lead farm workers here in this country. Y en defensa de los inmigrantes también en este país. And defend immigrants and immigrant rights in this country. Nosotros como trabajadores agrícolas en este país carecemos de derechos. As farm workers here in this country, we lack certain rights. Sufrimos de todo en este país. And really we suffer from many things. Pero organizaciones como la de Rocla. But organizations like yours, Rocla. Y mujeres como Ucrania. And women like Ucrania. Son la esperanza nuestra. They are our hope. Y decimos también que son ángeles en la tierra en este país. And we say that they are also angels on earth here in this country. Ahora quiero decir que las mujeres juegan un papel muy importante. And I want to say that women um, have a very important role. Como líderes desde sus hogares. As leaders in their homes. Y como líderes en grupos como este. And leaders in groups like this. Quiero terminar diciendo que el líder no se hace, el líder nace. And I want to I finish by saying that a leader is not made, a leader is born. Y Grania nació para ser líder. Grania was born to be a leader. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Hola a todos. Um, hello everyone. Mi nombre ya lo conocen, soy Daniel Larios. Everybody knows my name now, I'm Daniel Larios. De Jalisco, Mexico. I'm from Jalisco, Mexico. Vine a este país. I, I came to this country. Para saber qué pasó de la muerte de mi hijo. To learn what happened with the death of my son here in this country. Porque murió el 29 de agosto. He died the 29th of August. Y nadie me notificó nada. And I was never notified. Hasta hoy en la fecha, la, la empresa para la que él trabajaba no ha dado la cara. And until this day, the company that he worked for has not notified me of anything. Ellos dicen que él tuvo la culpa de su accidente. They've said that he was at fault for his accident. Pero ayer fuimos nosotros, me acompañaron la señora Paola y un joven que está aquí presente que se llama Ken. Um, but I, I went with Paola and Ken to the place where he had his accident. Del Grupo Center, me acompañaron a Búfalo. Uh, the Worker Justice Center also went with me to Buffalo. Para hablar con la organización de OSHA. To speak with some officials from OSHA. Y OSHA dijo que la muerte de mi hijo equivale a siete mil dólares de multa para la empresa. And the officials from OSHA told me that the death of my son should be equal to $7,000 in fines and penalties for the organization. Y le, y le dieron el 15 de febrero, a partir del 15 de febrero, 15 días, y hasta ahora no ha pagado su multa. And they were notified the 15th of February that they had 15 days to pay that fine, and they have not paid it. Y le preguntamos, ¿es justo que el empleador agarre el más tiempo? Y nos contestaron, Ellos tienen el plazo que ellos decidan porque se estiró el tiempo. And we asked, is this fair? Is this right? That they can take as much time as they want? And we were told that they can take as much time as they need to. ¿Ustedes creen que es justo? Do you believe that this is fair? No. no. Mi hijo tenía una hija. My son has a daughter. Que tiene cuatro años de edad. Who is four years old. Se quedó sin padre. She no longer has a father. Y ahora yo estoy batallando en este país igual que todas las personas que están aquí de inmigrantes porque no conozco las leyes. And now I'm here in this country fighting just as the other farm workers do because I don't know the rules and the laws of this country. 
pero gracias a estas personas de esta asociación, de este grupo que me han dado la mano, but thanks to people like those of you here in this organization that have really given me your hand. Me han dado hospedaje, comida y una familia. Um, I've been given uh, a place to stay, food to eat, and I feel like I've been given a family. Les quiero agradecer en nombre de todos ellos todo lo que están haciendo por mí. And I want to thank all of you in the name of all the farm workers, everything you've done for me. Y pedirles a todos ustedes aquí presentes. And ask everyone who's here. De favor, que escuchen al señor José Cañas y traten de hacer algo por ellos, ya que por mi hijo ya no se puede hacer nada. And try to do as José Cañas has asked to do something for all of the, the farm workers and the immigrants who are here, because now for my son nothing can be done. Que los escuchen, los ayuden a perder el miedo que ellos tienen. That you listen to them, that you help them to lose their fear. Porque tienen miedo presentarse ante la autoridad. Tienen miedo de hablar. Because many of them are scared to talk to authorities. They are scared to talk. Se esconden como que si ellos hubieran cometido un delito. And they hide as if they had committed some great crime. Y el delito, el delito de estar aquí, de ser pobre, yo digo que no es un delito. And the crime of being here, of being poor, I think is no crime at all. Es fuerza para, de voluntad para levantarse. It's an effort that we have made to lift ourselves up. Por tratar de llevar una vida mejor a sus familias. To, to try to give a better life to our families. Verdad, quiero agradecerles a nombre de mi hijo y de mi familia allá en México. And I want to thank all of you in my son's name and the name of my family back in Mexico. Este espacio que me brindaron para escucharme. This space and time that you've given to listen to me. Y agradecerles a todas las personas que estuvieron presente en la marcha que hicimos temprano afuera del templo. And thank everybody who was present in the march that we did earlier um, outside the church. A todos ellos un millón de gracias en nombre de toda mi familia y de mi hijo y de todos los migrantes caídos que no encuentran soluciones a sus problemas. Muchas gracias. A million thanks to all of you, in the name of my son, my family, and all of the fallen immigrants who have not had the opportunity.